ಯುಗೇನ ಚಿತ್ತ ಪದೇನ ವಾಚಾ ಮಲ ಶರೀರ ವೈದ್ಯಕೇನ ಯೋಪಾಕರೋತ್ತ ಪ್ರವರ ಮುನೀನ ಪಾತಂಜಲಿ ಪ್ರಾಂಜಲೀರಾನತೋಸ್ಮಿ ಐ ಪ್ರಾಸ್ಟ್ರೆಟ್ ವಿತ್ ಫೋಲ್ಡೆಡ್ ಹ್ಯಾಂಡ್ಸ್ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ಪತಂಜಲಿ who benefited mankind by delivering yoga for mind gram of a speech and by removing impurities of the body through medicine so in the last class we stopped our discussion or while studying the 10th sutra of the second chapter of patanjali yoga sutra where we find the process of getting rid of the afflictions has been indicated what's that sutra te prati prasav heya sukshma see it actually in short is indicating the entire process entire spiritual process by which we can get rid of the afflictions the afflictions as we have told the pancha klesha avidya asmita rag dvesha abhinivesha very interesting that we generally the notion is we generally have the notion that it is the actions it is our work which binds us but actually it is not the action that binds us if the action is klishta if any of the vritti if any of the mental modulations is klishta is emotive is bound by some this uh, any of these five afflictions then only it becomes a cause of bondage there are two types of vrittis gyana vritti and the klishta vritti to be more precise there are three types of vrittis gyana vritti pragya vritti and the klishta vritti so what are they the vritti as we told any mental mental modulation is vritti now gyana vritti now throughout our day to day life there are so many things which gives us mere knowledge when i am just looking at the table or the chair no emotion is involved in that and that type of knowledge that type of vritti in no way is going to bind us is not the reason for our transmigration from life to life similarly the pragya vritti all the mental modulations which we adopt as our spiritual practice like japa dhyana those are the pragya vritti or thinking of your real self constantly discriminating that what you are and what you are not those are all pragya vritti they uh, obviously don't uh, don't bind us and at the same time it's actually the cause of our liberation so the only vritti which is of our concern is the klishta vritti the food which i like the moment i see it is not only the knowledge which i get out of it immediately a raga an attachment for it grows or someone i don't like the moment i see that person it is not just gyana immediately hatred or aversion is developing and these kleshas these afflictions raga dvesha abhinivesha is the cause of our bondage that's what binds us that's what results in the process of transmigration which we will take up today while studying the tw- from 12th to the 14th sutras we will take that up but before that the 10th sutra in gist speaks of the entire spiritual process uh by removing the afflictions 
which with which our vrittis are tabbed how it happens as we have studied that the kriya yoga with which this chapter the second chapter started that the three practices tapa swadhyay ishvara pranidhana these are the three practices which has been uh, titled as nomenclature as the kriya yoga so what are these, the tapa anything where i am trying to delay my gratification any practice by which i am trying to delay my gratification i am not just conceding to the impulses that entails in tapas so tapas doesn't mean that you have to stand in one feet throughout the day or maybe for years together all those practices may have its implications but here in the spiritual sense the real tapas is the delaying of the gratification and that helps you to grow detachment as in the last class we were saying that how it happens the common example when you are fasting for the first time when you are fasting by the time it's the, uh, it's uh, the time for your lunch you feel terribly hungry now as you have resolved that you are going to fast throughout the day you just restrain yourself from having food and the impression the first impression is most probably with this pang of hunger hunger i have to continue throughout the night it is going to be a quite arduous job challenging job but a very interesting thing you will find by late afternoon suddenly the pangs of hunger has hunger has vanished it's no more there what has happened that when in the lunch time it is time for you to take food the hunger the pangs of hunger hunger is nothing but the biological alarm system the biological alarm system is set on asking you to have food and when you ignore that after some time the alarm alarm system itself gets tired it stops and now you will find those who fast they all know it that the pangs of hunger continues for some time after that it stops and then you can continue with your fasting with your rituals with a light body with a refreshed body for the rest of the night so why we are giving this example that yes to certain extent that will is required to get rid of the impulses the obsessions which i find is not allowing me to progress in my spiritual journey so to certain extent the will power is required but it i won't have to continue with that fight against the impulses for infinite time after some time you find they are falling off they are no more disturbing and the detachment is becoming something spontaneous so that's the basic idea of tapas so what happens with the tapas we become we develop more and more viraga and that takes care of the affliction named as raga attachment with the help of tapas i'm developing more and more viraga which is attenuating reducing my intense attachment for the sense of pleasures of life and then ishwara pranidhana how it helps ishwara pranidhana that it is a special type of devo- devotion where i resigned myself to the divine i don't keep anything for myself the divine who is sitting in my heart i have the idea this basic awareness that all the so called good emotions the good qualities the good traits that i have like love compassion fellow feeling thinking of the well-being of others those qualities if you judge is not something which you own it is not that you have developed the god has implanted those good feelings within your heart when the mother loves the child it's not that the mother's credit is there for it god has made the creation in such a way that the mother is bound to love the child if we know that what happens that instead of thinking i am loving i become aware of the fact that in this creation 
God is taking care of his creation. I am just the channel. It's the God's love which is flowing through the mother to take care of God's creation of the child. Once we have that awareness, then the question of expectation falls off. That it's not me. I'm just a mere instrument through which God is working. That's what has been indicated in the Bhagavad Gita. Nimitta matra bhava savya sachi. Just become the nimitta, just the instrument. It is I who am working through you. Once we have that, what happens? Now, if my love is reciprocated, well and good. If it is not reciprocated, the child grows up, becomes a totally anti-social element, brutal, cruel, behaves badly with the parent. But as the so-called the parent, or because of that awareness, that I am after all an instrument, I have done the job as being an instrument of the divine, what all nourishment, what all care, education has to be given, was given to the child through me. Now the child's own sanskaras are unfolding. I in no way feel dejected or sad about it. I have done my job. So there what happens for all the so-called, the repercussions which come for your love, for your compassion, you in no way feel that uh, tremendous, that dejection, that is not there. So what has happened, the dvesha, the dvesha, the hatred factor falls off with Ishwara Parigam. When you're totally resigned to the divine, there cannot be any hatred towards anyone. So Ishwara Pranidhana takes care of the hatred, it attenuates the hatred and the, what you say, there's uh, Swadhyaya. Swadhyaya takes care of Abhinivesha. The tremendous clinging to life, tremendous fear for the death. How? When the Swadhyaya means the repetition on your conviction, and the Guru is giving you the mantra. The mantra actually speaks of the intellectual conviction which you have developed after hearing the scriptures, after hearing the words of the Guru. That conviction now has to be repeated, Nididhyasana. First, the Guru or the scriptures gives me the spiritual instruction that I hear, Sravana. After that, I go on cogitating upon it. At the beginning, there is a lot of, there, is, there are many gaps in understanding. I humbly believe the fact that the scripture cannot be false. It is true. Most probably there is a lack of understanding. It's something I am lacking. It's not the scriptures which has to be doubted. And with that type of faith, when I go on doing manana, cogitating, at last the intellectual conviction comes. And that's the proper time when Guru, to match your intellectual conviction, gives the mantra. That is the end, there your intellectual conviction is encoded in that. Now comes the process of Nididhyasa, which will take you to the ultimate realization. But before ultimate realization, the Nididhyasana can actually help us to get rid of Abhinivesha. How? Even in your day-to-day -day life, you will find that when you do something with your full attention, the other things, your attention for the other things, their distractions automatically falls off. When you are talking to someone, you will find that if, one, if someone calls you, if there is some noise, you get distracted. Why? Because just to continue with the conversation, only a part of your mind is required. But when you are watching the televisions, your favorite game is going on, someone calls you don't hear. The more you are attentive, the more you are focused, the more part of your mind is engaged in that thing. Very little portion of your mind remains to take care of other activities. Not only that, if you go on intensely doing something with more and more focus, a surgeon when operating on a patient, for eight hours, most probably he's standing, he have not even drank a single uh, glass of water, no food, but he doesn't feel. Why? His total focus 
was on the edge of the scalpel. He knew very well, he or she knew very well, a little mistake can be at the cost of the life of the patient. That necessity gave a tremendous concentration. And that concentration was so intense, the mind had no scope to take care even of hunger, what to speak of the external distractions, of hunger, thirst, nothing, because the entire mind is absorbed in that. And as a result, what happens? As long as the surge, there's a surgeon is in the operation theater, is undergoing that surgery process, is just undertaking that surgery, you will find he has almost lost the sense of body. It's only when the surgery, this operation is over, then he feels, oh, I'm so tired. I'm thirsty, I'm hungry. Not before that. So the more we are focused, the more the bodily feelings also falls off. You become as if we, they, her. So in Nidhi Dhyasana, when you are doing the Swadhyaya, you are repeating the mantra. The more you become adept in it, the more the flow ensues, the more your mind gets absorbed in it, the more the bodily feeling starts falling off. The tremendous clinging to this psychophysical existence start just gets loosened. And as a result, what happens? That abhisneha, that the tremendous clinging to life, the fear of death, that gets attenuated. So these are the, this Kriya Yoga helps us to get rid of the ultimate evolutes of affliction, Raga, Dvesha, Abhinivesha. But this Raga, Dvesha, Abhinivesha, this all the three has evolved from Asmita. The conscious principle, which in no way is limited within the psychophysical physical existence, starts thinking because of the ignorance that it is the psychophysical existence. And from that Raga, Dvesha, Vinivesha comes. So what we have to take care of is the Asmita. After we have taken care of Raga, Dvesha, Abhinivesha to certain extent, the intensity has been reduced. It, has, it can not go off totally till the Asmita is taken care of because Asmita is the cause of all those three. So after I have attenuated, after I have reduced the strength to a certain extent, now comes the practice of Viveka Khyati, constantly contemplating on your real nature, that I am not the body, not the mind, not the senses. I am the Atman, Aham Brahmasmi. So this purifies you. This constantly, this thought is knocking in the head of the Asmita. The Asmita is like the hub of the will. Raga, Dvesha, Abhinivesha, all these three are like the spikes. By plot of practice, I may get rid of one addiction. It is just getting rid of one of the spikes. But the will is still intact because the hub is there to support the other spikes. So how I can really get rid of the entire will? How the will can totally collapse? If I can just get rid of the hub itself all the spikes collapses at a time. And that's what is the practice of Viveka Khyati. It helps us to get rid of the Asmita. And then all the desires falls at a time. And that actually has been spoken of as the Sukshma. That when Raga, Dvesha, Abhinivesha has been attenuated, they become subtle. Then only through the practice of Viveka Khyati, I can enable Pratiprasava. Pratiprasava means what? Because of the ego, the ego is just like the whirlpool in, an ocean, in, a, in the river. You know, when, when the whirlpool is formed, it gathers whatever it finds in its surrounding. So ego is like a whirlpool. So when it is there, so it, this our personality is being developed by gathering in all the perceptions. And that is evolution. The will pool has set in and that, that's how we are evolving. Pratiprasava means dissolution. Prasava means evolution. Pratiprasava means dissolution. So when the ego was strong, it was constantly accumulating the sanskaras. Now, by constantly hammering on the ego, when you have gotten rid of the ego, 
the hub has been taken away, then the prati prasava dissolution sets in. This your identification with this limited psychophysical existence that starts falling off. That's what is meant by prati prasava. That alone can give you the assurance, the guarantee that there won't be any bondage for you anymore. As long as I am just dealing with a particular desire, know it for certain, there are other desires which still keeps you bound. It's the only when the ego has been got rid of, then only we can th really ensure that the liberation is waiting for me. So that's why in English they will say a very interesting thing that you know that in the Abrahamic religion the sin is given importance. That we sin, but in Vedanta we say we are not sinners. We are the perfectly pure beings. Conscious principle because of ignorance this ego has came into picture and all the so-called this all the uh, afflictions results from it. So in Vedanta actually sin is the I, the ego. If you take the word sin, S-I-N, sin, the core of sin is I. Literally between S and N the alphabet I is there. So the even the literally the core of sin is I. In Vedanta, in yoga, even in spiritual sense, not only just in the literal sense, the core of sin is I, that asmita. Get rid of it, the entire, that is what you say, the, your personality, which is nothing but the conglomeration of raga, dvesha, vinivesha, the things I like, the things I hate, the things which I'm afraid of. They just fall off at a time. So this idea can be very, clearly understood, we have given that example again and again that Ramakrishna with the help of a wonderful parable is explaining this idea that renunciation happens at a time. It's not that one by one we get rid of our attachments. That's just something uh, which has some immediate effect but in the long term effect real renunciation means all the desires falls off at a time. What's that parable? That a man, a, a villager was going out to have a dip in the village pond after the day's work and seeing him going out, suddenly the wife called him out and told, did you know, did you, have you heard that our neighbor, that the, the, our neighbor, the man, the person is a real detached person. Well, what have you seen in him that he's, you're saying that he's a detached? No, he is having, he was having 12 wives and he was renouncing them one by one. That's what Ramakrishna in a very funny way is just saying that story. And this man told, this man addressed his wife, you are fool. Can anyone renounce one by one? Do you want to see what renunciation is? Okay, I leave. I leave forever. See, he was going to have a dip in the village pond. He was just wearing a loin cloth and was having a towel on his shoulder. Nothing else. With that loin cloth and the towel in the shoulder, he left never to come back again. Ramakrishna is saying that is the renunciation. That it never happens just little by little. Just in a flash, it falls off. So when to the Viveka Khyati, the ego has been totally annihilated, the, all the desires, all our afflictions in the form of raga, dvesha, abhinivesha falls off at a time to render you freedom by ensuring the process of pratiprasava. So that's what we studied in the 10th sutra. In the last class we were studying that. And before that viveka khyati entails that pratiprasava, constantly what we have to do? That's 11th sutra says dhyana, Heya tat vrittaya, that meditation. That med through meditation, I find it's not easy. I cannot have that intense meditation at the beginning. And it may take years. And there are many who will say for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, I'm meditating as if it, 
it is of no ever ever that is there is no change in my life but is it really so we may not feel we may not sense any change but know it for certain change is happening to give a common example if rock a coarse rock is lying on the bed of the river the river bed water is flowing over it the river stream there is flowing over it at any moment of time you go and see the rock there is no change but in hundreds of years the same rock will become like a shivalinga totally smooth though no change was visible but it was happening so this flow of the river is just like that our meditation sometimes we feel there is no change nothing is transforming yes apparently it appears so but the change is happening gradually it is seeping in it is dripping it is changing your total psyche and the renunciation is bound to come it is not it won't come little by little when that real when all that what is the flow has at last enabled you to get rid of the ego then all the desires at a time will fall off so dhyana is the process of removing the angularities by constantly thinking of your real nature that i am the self even a devotee when he thinks that i am a devotee of god it is actually the same process why when when you think that you are a devotee of god god is i am do you ever think that that uh, just you are a limited being who was born at certain time who are going to die at certain time and your relationship with god is just like the relationship with your relatives with your husband with your wife with your children which is going to end with your death which started with your birth do we think that our relation with the god is something like that no the moment i am a devotee of god i know from the bottom of my heart that these all are temporary but my relation with god is eternal i am eternal god is eternal and our companionship is eternal so now you will find what the devotee is doing is the same as the gyani he is constantly asserting his real eternal nature by his devotion to god and that also is helping him to get rid of that asmita so you will find basically it's all same that all those contradictions are apparent but it is doing if you go see to see the way it is programmed the programming which has ensued by in transforming your psyche it's almost the same process which has uh, been inducted by gyana as well as bhakti and that's the thing which has been spoken of as the dhyana either through devotion or through discrimination it has to be it has to go on till that viveka khyati ensues and pratiprasava happens so dhyana heya by meditation the gross modification of the vrittis has to be rejected so after saying this now that if we cannot now the question comes that why we have to get rid of afflictions with i we may say that i don't uh, i am quite happy with this uh, life with the pleasures and the afflictions of life here the yoga sutra will come that this actually is resulting in transmigration life after life because of these afflictions we are being tossed sometimes we are in the crest of a wonderful life and at the next moment we are in the trough we have fallen in the trough of total dejection a life where we find nothing is in my favorable condition that how it happens why it happens as long as the glaciers are there we are bound to be in this flux of crest and trough in this flow sometimes we are the peak sometimes we are the trough dejection it's bound to be there and it goes on through the process of uh, life and death cycle of life and death birth after birth how it happens very scientifically the yoga sutra deals with it from the 12th to the 14th sutra of the second chapter and this uh, patanjali yoga sutra uh, deals with from the 12th to the 14th sutra of the second chapter so now uh, we will share the screen to refer to the 
this 12th, 13th and the 14th Sutra. So the 12th Sutra. Klesha Mula Karmashaya Drishta Adrishta Janma Vedaniya. This is the 12th Sutra. That what it is speaking? Klesha Mula. As long as the afflictions are the are the mula, are the as are, are there as the origin. Just the way the seed is the mula of the plant. Similarly, when the kleshas are mula, are the origin, then what happens? Klesha mula karmashaya. Drishta adrishta janma vedaniya. And in this birth, the karmashaya is going to ensue. The word karmashaya is a technical term. We will try to understand. Yoga is a very, very scientific way of describing the process of transmigration. That karmashaya doesn't mean karma. It doesn't mean sanskara. It doesn't mean uh, vasana. All those terms sometimes we confuse to be the same. These have specific meaning. Once you understand, you will find that how scientific, how wonderful this Yoga Shastra is. This, this what is saying that Karmashaya becomes active either in this life or in the next life as long as the afflictions are there as the origin for all our thoughts, perceptions and actions. So now what this karma shaya mean? Now let us gradually try to understand. So what's the uh, thing which is going on in our mind constantly that we are all aware of is the vrittis. This constant mental modulation, it never stops. In the Yoga Sutra, they have told in the very beginning that even in deep sleep, the vrittis are there. Vrittis only stops by yoga. Yoga chitta vritti nirodha. The entire purpose of yoga is to stop those vrittis. Unless you have stopped those vrittis, the chitta continues. Now the word vritti is very interesting. What the word vritti means? Vritti doesn't mean mental modulation. Vritti actually means occupation, profession. Just to give an example, the doctor is vritti. What is the vritti of the medical? Is the, uh, the, a doctor's profession is the vritti. Is his vritti. His profession is his vritti. Now, what profession means? The doctor sustains himself by his profession. That is the vritti. An engineer sustains himself by his profession, by being an engineer, the work he does as an engineer, for that he gets paid and that by that he sustains himself. So vritti actually means profession. Then why the modulations of mind has been termed as vritti? Very interesting. Why? Because as long as those modulations are there, the chitta is sustained. It is not going to die off. So that's why they are the occupation of the chitta. I have to get rid of them so that the pratiprasava, the chitta falls off to allow me to understand who I am, really who I am. That's the basic difference between the Eastern philosophy and the Western philosophy. In the Western philosophy, the soul is equated with the mind as if the mind is the soul. And the Eastern philosophy, Oriental philosophy, the idea is you can know who you are only when you can go beyond the mind. So this vritta is the thing which is the cause of our bondage. Now, just as we today started our discussion, this vritti, we all know can be two types. One is the jnana vritti, a klishta vritti, and the other is a klishta vritti. Non-afflictive means my emotions, my 
um, modulations, this each and every mental modulation is not connected with any emotions or any feeling. Just when I see the table, the chair, it's just, it gives me knowledge. When I'm doing mathematics, it is in no way giving me happiness or something. It's just knowledge. Such type of vrittis are jnana vritti. They are aklishta. We have nothing to do with them. The other type of vritti is the klishta vritti, which is afflictive. That all our spiritual endeavor is to get rid of that klishta vritti. Now this klishta vritti creates what you say that is because of that results in bhoga vritti, isn't it? All the klishta is linked with bhoga, the enjoyment, the experience, that the delicacy which I like, you're going, uh, you're down the street and there is a sweet meat shop. Just by seeing the delicacies there, immediately that experience that the sriti, the memory comes, oh, previously I have tested. It is such and such and such and such delicacy is wonderful. You're drawn towards it. So what is happening? The klishta vritti is resulting in the bhoga vritti and that results in the bhoga samskara. That sometimes I've already tested that delicacy that has created the samskara. Again, by seeing it, the memory comes back. That is bhoga samskara results in bhoga smriti. The memory comes back. When they have this bhoga smriti, it results in karma. I'm drawn. I'm just now walking towards the sweet meat shop. This bhoga smriti is motivating me to act upon it. Karma. Now, this bhoga sanskara, bhoga smriti, karma, all these are again becoming, getting converted into sanskara. They're not lost. Once you have enjoyed the delicacy, it remains as sanskara. And the karma you are doing, that again, when you see it, that your motivation to go and have it, that also has a karma sanskara. Karma sanskara, jnana sanskara, both remains as vasana in your deep subconscious mind. This, our mind is full of vasas, innumerable vasanas are there. So many things for lives together we are enjoying, these all samskaras at last sediments in the subconscious mind as vasana. So that is one thing happening. Another thing is happening. What is karmasha? And I will just try to understand that vasana is all the samskaras which is sedimenting in your mind to form that, uh, uh, to uh, form the subconscious mind, it is there. Now, what is karmashaya? There's a term which has been used here. Karmashaya is very interesting. That my when I do action in one way, it produces sanskara. In another way, it is producing some favorable condition where my sanskaras will be fructified. There are two things. To give, with, the example is the best way to understand. Suppose a small child has developed the liking for studies. The child likes to study. And as a result, it is found that he, is good, he or she is good in all the subjects. He or she is performing well and just being promoted from grade after grade and reaches the 12th standard. And because of the very good grades, now all the so-called higher education streams are open to him or her. He or she can enter the medical college or the engineering college or some uh, professional course, any other professional course or academic course, everything is open. Now he or she chooses to be a medical student, gets admitted to the medical college. Now what is karma, Shaya, you will understand that when that student was, has developed the liking for study, the sanskara one that it was a direct that liking for study that the studies has resulted in the good sanskara in the form of liking for study. That is something which I have the direct control. It is a direct result of my karma, direct result of my uh, repeated actions. It is a direct result, it is a sanskara. But the medical college, is it the result of my action? It is the result of the collective effort. The entire society has contributed to build that medical college. 
that my interest in studies in no way is going to build up that huge medical college with a huge campus. Now what has happened that my action in one way it's creating sanskara, in another way the collective effort, effort has created a wonderful circumstance where I will be gravitated, where I will be gravitated to fructify the, all the sanskaras which I have developed through my endeavor. So this is the wonderful idea in the Yoga Sutra. So Karmasha is something which is not karma. The word itself you will understand. Ashaya means receptacle. That karma, the receptacle of karma, that your karma has taken you to a particular receptacle. Now you find the favorable circumstances for those karma to fructify. Now you will understand a very another interesting thing. That karmashaya, that once that karmashaya, particular karmashaya has uh, got activated. Now there are so many vasanas. All those vasanas are not going to be manifested just at a time. Based on the karmashaya, only particular vasanas will find expression in your life. In that particular jati. To give an example, see that student, like in, let us go back to the example of the student. The student, when he was or she was in the school, he or she was good in all the subject. He or she has an interest in all the subjects. But the moment he or she gets admitted to the medical college, now the interest in all other subjects, that gets shadowed. Only the interest in the biological science, that now manifests. So why? Because now being a medical student, this karmashaya, this medical student, only this vasana is favorable for that. Others are there, but they're hidden. They're not seen. But most probably in the later life, when already he's established or she's established as a doctor, and now he or she has some laser. And then quite at an advanced age, that the love for the music which he or she had as a child, that comes back. And now or she gets some time to practice that, to cultivate that. What it was hidden. So that's the idea of karmasha, a wonderful idea. Why it has been spoken of? That actually, you know, that many will be opposing the idea of my past experiences has resulted in the present inclinations. They say it's just hereditary. Here we find yoga has given a wonderful rational way of understanding the vasanas. He's saying that if everything is in the memory, why don't they manifest? To give a very common example, a funny example, that if we believe in the theory of evolution, then most probably we were a grazing animal some three, four lives, uh, 10 lives back. Now as a grazing animal, the green grass was something which we really liked. So the desire for that having green grass is supposed to be there deep in my psyche. Now as a human being, I never find that uh, that green grass is something attractive to me. I never salivate seeing the green grass. You may salivate seeing a delicacy, but seeing this green grass, I never salivate. But if it is in deep in my psyche, why don't I really feel that urge to go and have it? So that's the question. So here Yoga Sutra says, just the way for the medical student, when the Jati is medical student, other desires get shadowed here also. For the human birth, only those vasanas which are appropriate to the human birth, they only manifest. The others are there. If I again have to regress back to the animal birth because of my bad karma, they will again regress back. They will again manifest. If I regress back, they will manifest. But they are hidden. So now you will find the importance which we have already spoken of in the 10th sutra, that how to get rid of the ego. If you think that all the desires which has manifested in life, I will take care of them one by one. Know it for certain. You can never attain liberation because there are so many desires you are not aware of. They are hiding there in the subconscious mind. 
to spring up the moment they get the favorable circumstance. As Sri Ramakrishna used to say, a seed was lying on the terrace for a decade, for 10 years. It was almost like dead seed. And one day a strong wind just came and blew that seed and it fell in the ground. The moment it fell on the fertile ground, it sprouted. It was appearing as lifeless. So similarly in our psyche, there are so many desires which they, as they are not favorable for this present birth, are lying there like the dead seed. But moment they get the favorable circumstances, they will sprout. So how can I get liberation? Now all those desires are hooked to that asmita. So to have to get rid of that. So that's why we have already studied. Now you will understand that how they are saying that glaciers, which is linked with the asmita, as long as they have not been taken care of. You can never get rid of them one by one. So there are so many vasanas which are hidden. So how the birth, our karmasha is effect, taking effect? As per the karmasha, when I'm born in a particular body, only those vasanas which are favorable to that body finds expression as jati ayu bhoga. That will determine your jati, the species in which you are born, are you, your lifespan and bhoga, the experiences which you have to go through. To understand that, let us go back to that example of that medical student. The moment that he or she gets admitted to the medical college, the jatis, what species that he or she is a medical student. Are you, what is the are you, speaks the duration for which he has or she has to be in that course. And bhoga. Now, the moment one gets chance in the medical college, that doesn't mean that they are going to have the same experience. Someone is a really intelligent student, really hardworking. They easily pass through the course without much hurdles. But the one who somehow entered that college, you will find that they are really facing the challenges, a lot of hurdles. They are finding the course to be quite difficult. It is giving them quite a lot of pain. So that all the medical student doesn't have the same experience. So the bhoga can be different. The same thing happens with our birth. In this present birth, what that our tendency, all the tendencies, the resultant tendency will decide the course for the next birth. Once it is decided, what, the, what will be the lifespan? What all experiences we have to go through? That also is determined by that the what all vasanas has filtered through that jati. Why on that it depends. And that has been indicated in this sutra. This klesha mul, as long as the kleshas are there, the karmasha is bound to fructify. Either in this birth itself, just as in the case of the medical student, in this birth itself, or in the next birth. Suppose we will find that there are so many ch this ch child prodigies. And sometimes we are surprised that how can such a small child be so good in music? As if from the very birth he or she has learned. What has happened? In the previous birth, most probably he had that sanskara. Many say that most of the child prodigy are born in a, uh, that type of family, a musician's family. And that's why he is having the musical talent. But again, the Yoga Sutra says, yes, that's quite obvious. Your this like for music, your liking for the music has gravitated you to a family where you get that environment where that will be fructified. And in a very, very tender age, you find it is manifesting in a wonderful way. So that's the idea that of Janmanta, that either in this birth itself or in the next birth, you are getting the favorable circumstances where the intense desire is now going to get fructified. Is going to manifest. You get that ashaya, that receptacle where you are going to manifest them. So this your what you say that your uh, afflictions, your likings, your dislikings. That's what gravitates you to a particular type of birth, to a particular type of environment. Today we will just with one example we will stop the discussion with this sutra. It's something which I have experienced.
uh, when I joined long back in one of our centers in Ramakrishna Mission in India. So as a Brahmachari, when I was in that center, suddenly a, from a devoted family, it was a very, it's a very uh, sad mishap, you can say, that somehow accidentally that the devoted parents who were a devotee of uh, this Ramakrishna tradition for quite long, their child got, because of wrong association, got addicted, was a drug addict. So they almost lost hope. They brought their child to the ashram and asked the in-church Swami, requested, will you please keep him? Don't allow this my child to go out. Let him stay in the ashram. Make sure that, that he never cross, he just goes out of the gate and keep him engaged, give him a lot of work for the shrine, for cleaning, for the dining hall, in the kitchen, in the garden, let him be throughout the day be engaged. That engagement most probably will help him to get rid of the addiction, this environment, wonderful environment and all those engagement. The Swami agreed, okay, you keep him here, let's see what we can do. At the beginning, we found that he's almost like a normal child. We never uh, realized that, the, that he's having a terrible addiction. But the first thing we started finding was, suddenly in our ashram, we never used to lock our doors. Our personal belongings were missing. If some of the Swamis had a radio, in those days the radio was there to, for, for hearing the news, suddenly we found the radio is not there, the alarm clock is not there, the watch is not there. These all small tidbits were missing. If someone had some little personal money missing, no one understood that who, that because the ashram is totally secure. So this boundary wall is there, the gate is there, the gatekeeper is there. There is no questions of some someone coming from outside and stealing the thing. It must be the inmates. But no one had an idea, no clue that who is doing that. And then one day, in the shrine, the pranami box, the offering box, that itself was totally. Uh, unscrewed and taken, the box was missing, the entire box was taken away. And we first scolded the security guard thinking that most probably he was, he fell asleep. Someone must have entered. And it happened the second time. Again, there's this offering box was totally taken away. And for after three, four months, suddenly one day at the date of the night, the security was blowing the whistle very strongly and he went and just called us all the monks please come and we found that he has tied that kept that boy just locked in a room that which boy the one who was the drug addict who was staying in the ashram apparently he was leading a normal life now the security guard took us to that boy and asked that boy show what were you doing now, as the boy was already caught red-handed, he took us beyond, be behind the garage and he showed us that he has dug one hole there. Previously, twice, he actually has removed the offering box and kept those offering box in that hole, which, is, which was not noticed by anyone. For the third time when he was doing, he was caught. So we were really surprised. He asked, why, why are you doing this? Why are you? And then we found that all the tidbits which were stolen was actually he who was the one who was the miscreant. He was just stealing the things from the ashram. And we asked, why, why, why are you doing this? And what he told was really shocking. This boy not as for a single day went out of the ashram, not for a single day. He never went out of the ashram. He was in the ashram. And that is something that ashram is in a place which is hundreds of kilometers away from his native place. So that locality was totally new to him. No one was known to him outside. So the parents were almost ensured that he, as he has been dissociated from his old associations. So he's a bit safe. If he can stay in the ashram, he will be a bit safe. And that's what we thought. Now what he told was really something, uh, it was shocking. He told that this, the drug peddler somehow sensed that there is an addict here in this. 
the ashram anyone can enter when the peddler has entered and started giving drugs free to this boy now no one has no one has noticed not only that after some time he started asking for money and then where to get the money he started stealing and at last this is the fate he made with and then we have to call the parent he had to take away but why we are staying this story just see that what's the karma share that if you have a desire it is bound to be fulfilled that environment will be created he was in a total new place he was not known to anyone the old association was totally cut off see the drug peddlers never came to us it was just to that person somehow they sensed that that he is a drug addict see from that in the total new atmosphere he gravitated to that environment where his desires is bound to be fulfilled so that's how strong the desires are once you have a desire you will be gravitated to that circumstance for and that will force you to fulfill to be in it and fulfill those desires so unless we can get rid of them this process goes on karma shaya is that field where we are gravitated again and again where our sanskaras that strong sanskaras fructifies so this will give an idea that what this transmigration process which the vedant which yoga is speaking of here so in a very nice way the yoga has dealt with this idea of transmigration so we have to need another two sutras there's this actually this jati ayu bhoga this has been spoken of in the next sutra that we have already discussed what that sati mule tad vipake jati ayu bhoga that the, as long as this kleshas are there in the, the root this karma shaya produces what this particular birth or in a particular species which determines your life span and which determines the experiences which you have to go through so this the 13th sutra which will take take up in the next class let's stay lada paritapa phala punya apunya hetutvat so this so be as based on your good and bad actions the experiences will be according we will accrue accordingly so that will be taken up in the 14th sutra we will take up that 14th sutra before we proceed to the next sutra uh, the 15th sutra which will be dealing with some different subject so uh, here we conclude our uh, discussion today and just before uh, uh, stopping our class i have an announcement please wait one minute let me just stop